because this, <laughs> this, okay. I have so many things to say, actually. Are we recording now? Well, uh, we Oh, can... we have to do the freaking intro. Okay. This is a podcast. <laughs> Fuck. We're not just talking. Okay. <laughs> I am Doug Friedman. I am Kenzie Janest. And this is Your Mental Breakdown. The podcast. But that's not important right now because no, Kenzie not. has something I to say. I have so much on the tip of my <laughs> prefrontal cortex right now and I got to get it out. Okay. Oh boy. Doug just asked me if I knew what friends was. Can just we because just, I don't no, know that you no. have any. Can we all... <laughs> That's fair. Can we all have a moment of silence for the fact that Doug thought I didn't know what Friends was? I've watched Friends from front to back, and I will not say that it's one of my favorite shows anymore because I feel like it's kind of aged like milk. Mm. Yeah, it's not I get that. Great. I get that. Watching it now is a little cringy yeah. with the current state of things, but at the time when I watched it, <laughs> loved it. Comfort show. Okay, here's the embarrassing thing, Doug, that I saved for this moment. No, please. <laughs> because you know, I'm in my fuck it era, I guess. I'm just going <laughs> to let everyone know I'm an idiot. Troy and I were watching Curb Your Enthusiasm the other day. Yeah. Our new favorite nighttime sure. put on a show uh-huh. show. Incidentally, have you ever heard of Seinfeld? Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> go ahead. All right. Yes. Okay. So friends, uh-huh. Curb Your Enthusiasm, Seinfeld. Seinfeld? Yeah. What do they all have in common? What are they? They're sitcoms. Yeah. Guess who didn't know that a sitcom stood for situational comedy? You with the television background? Me with the television background, Doug. Wow. I, and it's a weird story because I put it together in a very weird way. I was like, God, like, what are these shows even about? They just end up in these weird freaking situations. <laughs> <laughs> and Troy was like, Kenzie, <laughs> he literally was like, situational <laughs> comedy. And I said, huh? I like fell to the floor. I'm 31 years old now. Uh, okay. If you say so. I'm, I'm technically <laughs> on paper 31 years old. But developmentally, at least in the <laughs> television world. Not good really not good well if it makes you feel better you won't (laughs) it might you can't (laughs) you really can't so anyway (laughs) is this where i'm gonna drop my question oh you have a question i actually have a question let's go you are a listener and you have a question so this is a listener question this is technically a listener question because it's like a pre-listener question (laughs) because i listened to the session obviously while i was prepping and taking my notes but you haven't you listened do. to this episode yet i have not oh god don't <laughs> rank my brain hurt it's too early for this no i have not listened to the episode yet so my question is involving the actual session oh and i thought this would be obviously a question for the breakdown but i was like you know what it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> if I do say so if myself. If I do say so myself. <laughs> I think as a listener, but also as a therapist, like this mm. question comes to mind a lot. Mm. You know, a lot of, especially like maybe young adults, you know, 30 year old, they're they're thinking, God, I don't want to be my parents. I don't want to end up like my parents, please. Dude, not just 30 year old. Okay, everyone. 20 year old, 40 everyone. year old, 50 sure. year old, sure. 70 year old. Yes. And okay. If they end up in therapy and in Drew's case, which we'll see, we're basically telling them like, look. You're not your parents. You're not borderline narcissistic. Maybe we've got traits, but you're not. You don't fit the criteria, right? Right. And we had a listener question a couple of weeks ago, right? That was like, what if I'm a narcissist? Right. So here's my flip side question. What if they are the narcissist? (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) And I know it's like, oh, well, okay, they're a narcissist. We got to work on it. But in the moment, in session, if it's like, oh, they got the awareness or the concern of like, I don't want to be my parents. And we can say, you're not your parents, obviously, you're your own person, but maybe you are borderline or narcissistic. I love when you ask questions because you answer them when you ask them. It's it's fantastic, right? I mean, what you're saying is, okay, you're not your parents, you're your own person. And maybe that person of you and your own is a narcissist or is borderline. And that's something that You can help a client come to on their own, but if they're thinking of it as, I don't want to turn into my mom, or I don't want to turn into my dad, you're not going to. Right, because you literally can't. 
Right. But I've had a, a client before whose worst fear was being bipolar, right? Because her mom is bipolar, her sure. sister's bipolar. That's legit. And yeah. And I'm like, okay, it's totally possible. Hereditary, you know, all of it. Yeah. But quickly real, like she's not bipolar, you know, but it was like a thing that we talked about almost every session, like, like feeling crazy and going back and forth and the mood swings. And it's like, okay, you have mood swings sometimes, right? but you're not bipolar. I hear two pieces of that. Mm-hmm. One is that the client's actual fear of that being who or what they are, right? Yeah, yeah. That's legit. I get that. Right, like the identity sure. piece. Yeah. Then the other is, wow, you were significantly impacted by mm-hmm. how this person, your parent, mm-hmm. was to you and how you had to adjust your life for that person. Right. So mm-hmm. when they go, I don't want to be my mom. Wow, tell me about that. Because it mm-hmm. sounds like your mom had and probably still has a big impact on your yeah. life and how you live it and how you think about it. Mm-hmm. I can say, I remember... One particular manager I had in community mental health that (laughs) Meredith had also and was not a very good supervisor for some things and was decent for others. But I learned how to be an effective manager by going, I don't want to be as ineffective as that person. Doug, you're whipping out a story right now. It's it's this is what you do (laughs) so well. And we're seeing it right here in the moment. It's good. But that's, I, I think that's, I that's, that's how a, good, a lot of us are. Is yeah. I mean, do you remember in grade school doing a collage exercises in school? Did they still do that? Did they have collages? Like cutting out then? magazine things and yes. putting it like, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Sure. And going, these are the qualities that I like. Yeah, and this is what like I want. Like a vision board almost. Totally. Yeah, totally. definitely. That's a lot of how I think of these things. Mm. When you go, oh, I don't want to become this or I don't want to be that. Okay, yeah. what do you want to become? I want to become this. I want to embody this. I want to embody yeah. that. Yeah. Like, then we can kind of pick and choose how we're going to mm-hmm. be, how we want to identify ourselves, what we mm-hmm. want to embody. And there's a big mm-hmm. difference between saying, and we'll get into this as we get into yes. the breakdown. Yes. I don't want to become this is mm-hmm. one thing. I mm-hmm. do want to become that. Right. Right. I say this a lot. It's more empowering to go towards something than to run away from something. Right. Well, it's like with therapy goals, we're not going to say we're trying to decrease anxiety, right? It's like, no, we're trying to increase a certain healthier behavior or something. That's that's the whole shift like 20 years ago where Mm -hmm. psychotherapy became more strengths-based. Yeah. Positive psychology. Earlier, like 30, 40, 50 years ago, it Mm -hmm. was about eradicating deficits and Mm -hmm. identifying a problem. Yes. Problem focused. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Instead of solution focused. Yeah. Or strength-based. Yeah. Which thank God we made that shift. Right. Yeah. It reminds me too. Well, you kind of covered it, but how by knowing what we don't want to be, we can then clearly see what we do want to be because often there's an inverse or an opposite that is a different value or it shows your values and we can work towards that. That's something we can actually work towards, right? But the trying to get rid of a deficit or something is- And what you're saying, when clients come in feeling guilty about something and they want to Mm -hmm. like absolve themselves of their guilt. Guilt is a great emotion to work with right? because it often tells you what you care about. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, my line is it's the roadmap yeah. to your integrity. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's so that's good. That's a better way of putting it. Well, it's all the same thing. We're saying yeah. the same thing. Yeah. If you feel guilty about something, it's because you acted outside of how you really want to act, how you mm-hmm. really want to be what your integrity says. Right. So that helps identify what your integrity is. Mm hmm. I could riff off that forever because I'm like, oh, but what if guilt turns into shame and it's excessive and blah, blah, blah. But no, we don't got time for that, right? Uh, Right. But that, (laughs) however, I will say, (laughs) okay, give us if guilt turns into shame, yes. Okay, we can deal with the shame and we can talk about that. But let's get to the root. The root is the guilt. And the guilt is Mm. because you were outside of your integrity. Mm. Not necessarily hands down 100% of the time, that's what it is. Right, because sometimes you feel guilty because you have anxiety, but you're not actually objectively in the wrong and you didn't do anything poorly, but maybe you just feel that way. That's the subjective experience, you know sure. what I mean? And sometimes yeah. it's irrational or distorted or whatever, but right. but it's serving some sort of function either way, like that feeling of guilt. You know, what makes me feel guilty is when we don't serve the function I of- I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I, I saw it coming. <laughs> It makes me feel so shameful when people don't like and subscribe to our podcast and leave reviews. (laughs) Uh There you go. And if they wanted to rectify that, Uh how would they do that, Kenzie? If you're feeling guilty about not participating and leaving a question (laughs) for this podcast, please rectify this by leaving a question for us to answer or a review for us to read <laughs> exactly. and cry about exactly bad. you can email us at info at your mental breakdown.com find us on all the social media platforms i think 
at probably your dot mental dot breakdown or just look for us and find us somewhere. I have faith in your abilities. It's 2024. Sure. People can figure it out. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Unless they're listening to this 10 years from now and TikTok doesn't even exist. Oh, that would be lovely. God, what a dream. <laughs> they're trying to ban it. Yeah. They're yeah. censoring. They pulled a bunch of music. Yeah, I don't, I don't know it. enough to actually talk on that, but I just don't like TikTok. Yeah. Well, you know what you do like? This podcast. That's right. <laughs> and talking about Drew. We will cut out of here and let you listen to the session and we'll be back to break it down in a few. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, now lay it on me. Now, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. And I don't really know where to start, so I'm going to start with my hospital shit. Oh, did you see a specialist? Yeah, went in. Quick little five minutes, five, ten minutes. He was basically like, yeah, I don't think any of this is like that real. I think the paramedics probably fucked up, and you are seemingly completely fine. I don't feel that sound in the answer. I don't feel that... I don't feel very equipped in what all of that was to give me the answer. And at the end of it, he was like, yeah, man, so they're going to call you in like three weeks. And so I have to go do a stress test. Right. And they're like, yeah, if they don't call you, just keep calling them. And I was like, I, I don't I don't really care at this point to do any of that. And so uh, I'm just kind of chalking it up is I'm OK. Everything's fine. And we're good to go. Mm. And that's kind of like a story of my last couple of weeks. Okay. I know you weren't looking forward to it. You were looking forward to getting resolved, Mm -hmm. but that's, yeah. Yeah. I was super anxious just sitting kind of in the lobby and, you know, hands sweaty, pit in my stomach, that kind of thing. Just because I hate hospitals. So I, I think that had something to play with it. I think I was a little too nervous to talk the way we talk and sit down and kind of go list by list and spew and get the answers and go back and forth. So the questioning wise was first question. He was like, yo, what happened? Kind of went through it. And he was like, hmm, OK. And then the other questions that I was asking were more so along the lines of right. and he was like, well, you're you're young. All your blood pressure is good. Your cholesterol is good. Like going down the list, everything is kind of on on point. And there was no reason to think of anything was different. So you don't have a whole lot of confidence in the answers that you got from him. And yet doing the stress test is something that you're kind of like, eh, forget it. But let me ask you something. If this was your soon to be son. (laughs) I knew that was coming. I think honestly, I think I'm kicking myself in the pants more so for not going the natural path route the way I wanted to. And so I would still probably start with the way I started with my shit, but I would have geared up more towards the natural path for him because I think that that's a little bit more sound and and I speak that language a little bit better. Part of getting down on yourself is actually looking at what you want to do going forward, not what you should have done looking backwards. I get it. I understand that. Like, I'm, I'm down on myself. I should have done this. I should have. I hear that as it wasn't very satisfying when I saw this guy. And maybe we could say, if you went to saw a naturopath, you might be sitting here going, man, I'm a little bummed. I didn't just see a cardiologist and just find out definitively. Hindsight's 2020. Right. And I, I think the idea is right now, you don't feel confident and resolved. And part of wanting to see a naturopath might be, maybe I still do. Maybe my heart is important to me. Maybe there's something that didn't show up there, but the paramedics saw and I'm unresolved and I have some anxiety about it. And all right, let me see a naturopath and see what they say. I think that that idea of what would you say to your son taps into that parental figure, the one that like, well, let's cover all bases. Let's be safe. Let's be sure. Now that we've, we've kind of paused for a second and it's you and me, if you be that parent to yourself, what's the parental advice you would give yourself? I think it's making me see health from a different perspective and understanding mm-hmm. that health is wealth and that it's very important, especially as I get older, because it's just never something that I've ever really thought about doing. Like I never really had random checkups. It's more so finding what I'm comfortable with and speaking the same terms. 
and finding somebody that can relate to me on that level and talk to right. me within what that is. And I want to be careful that I don't want to just see anybody that can talk the way I need to understand it. Obviously, I want to see a legitimate doctor that legitimately understands what they're talking about. Right. Because I've been to naturopaths that are just like, yeah, just take some vitamins. You'll be okay. I think blending the two and focusing more on the sun conversation, I'm learning. I'm figuring it out. And, yeah. and I'm getting yeah. a better understanding of where I stand in all of this. Mm. Good. I like that. If you just took the Bible for what your pastor told you it was or what your parents told you it was, you wouldn't have your relationship with God. I think when it comes to your health, you're learning and it's your health. Feeling like you're comfortable enough to ask the questions is tough no matter what. Yeah. You know, we're going to feel nervous when we go to doctor's office, a lot of us. Right. Right. But there is something important about, will they hear my questions? Will they take their time? Will they explain it to me in a way that I understand it? One of the lines I, I love, I picked up, it's not mine, but somebody says, wait, 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 explain this to me like I'm, like I'm a sixth grader mm -hmm. or a six-year-old, either one. Like, explain <laughs> it to me like I'm six. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I want. I think our analogy of shifting gears and being in different gears comes into a big effect into what that is. And even on my end, not being stuck in first gear. And instead of going all the way to six to meet them on doctor level, maybe meeting on like three or four. Right. I love that, that, that you brought in the shifting gears because you no, you're not in first. You're using your gears. You are certainly not in park and you're not jamming it into reverse on the freeway anymore. So I think about all of this, you know, and I also think about my mom a lot in all of it and the way I watched mm. her go to doctors. This is a two-part thing, and I'm going to lay it on you, and I'm just going to let yep. it go, and you let me know how it sounds. So first, and this has been sitting sitting in my stomach for the last probably five, six, seven weeks since I, we talked about it maybe two months ago, and the word was narcissism, and yep. that goes hand in hand with my mom. So pause on that. I'm going to let that one sit. Now going back to hospitals and watching my mom go into them and never fully having an understanding of why she was going to have surgeries and why the doctors were doing what they were doing. All I heard was, well, this doctor fucked up, gave her the wrong medicine. Well, this doctor gave us antidepressants and now she's drinking and this, that, the other. And, and I correlated a lot of my mom's own problems with doctors as a scapegoat to somebody to blame. Throwing in the narcissism within what that is, I also watched my mom play a lot of pity cards and get a lot of, I don't want to say attention, but a lot of people put on capes to go help her. And I'm trying to connect dots now, and I like when people put on capes for me too, but I have to have some sort of narcissism within me too. And I don't think that's a good or a bad thing. I, I think I'm just being aware of it, especially aware of the surroundings I was brought up in. And that's how I know how to navigate because it's what I saw. So I, I play a little bit of my narcissistic tendencies within this last year of the hospital. And then I question myself and it's like, well, did this really happen? Or am I just using this as a way to get some extra attention? And if that's the case, then what the fuck am I doing? And that makes a whole different set of emotions come into play with all of this. I'm confused and I don't quite understand what happened. And I don't know if I am using this as a way for a girlfriend to show me a little extra attention when I'm having a hard day, or if it's really happening, or if it's just made up in my head. My first part is, okay, was any of this really real? And then my second part of that mm -hmm. is opening the door to the conversation of what narcissism is in my life and how do I play into it and where does it play into me? If you've been thinking about that for a while since we touched on it, then we want to look at how that has impacted you externally and how it impacts you internally. And before we do look at that, I want to fine tune a little bit of this, okay? Because I think what you're describing is not narcissism, it's, it's borderline. Mm. Those are both psychological terms. And we're not talking about diagnosing, like from the big manual that we, that we use, like, oh, there's your diagnosis. This is what's <laughs> wrong with you. That's your mental illness. That's not right. what I mean. 
I mean, yeah. these are characteristics that we all have to mm-hmm. some degree. And for some people, it is so pronounced to such a degree that it impairs their ability to function every day and their ability to maintain relationships. Mm-hmm. When we talk about narcissism, that's kind of, if I'm talking to a six-year-old or a sixth grader, I would say that's like a selfishness right. where it's all about me, mm-hmm. right? And I'm obsessed with myself. It's really hard for me to see outside of anything but me. Right. When we touched on that with mom, it was mixed in with borderline. And yeah. that's closer to, I think, what you're looking at and experiencing in terms of yourself. Because that all about mm-hmm. me thing doesn't fit you. Right. The borderline thing is a little different. That does have something to do with how you think and feel about yourself, how you think and feel about others, how others think and feel about you. At the root of it is because you have an intense fear of abandonment. Usually what you'll, what you'll see in people that are borderline is that when things are going great, they love you, they're all over you, they, they want more, they need to have more of you. They constantly want that validation and to be around and to not be alone because they don't want to lose a, a relationship, lose a connection, because that will mean they lose love, so they need to keep the love. And if something feels like it's threatening that, then they'll get angry, impulsive, lash out, put up the wall. You don't exist to me anymore. I have nothing to do with you. It, it's, it's a little hot or cold. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to understand what that is and what that means on the outside. Cause some other people are like, I just couldn't like call you back for two days. Cause I lost my phone. <laughs> wow. Why are you saying I'm, you're, I'm dead to you now? Because that abandonment got hurt. When I was talking about your mom, and we were talking about that, you know, a couple of months ago. I said people that have these sort of narcissistic or borderline characteristics, you have to remember like three things. Mm. You remember this? Three <laughs> things about them. Number one, it's always about them. Mm-hmm. Number two, somehow they're going to make themselves out to be a victim. Mm-hmm. And number three, no matter what you do, it's never good enough. If my mom's telling me about a doctor, telling me about something, or even if I'm coming to her and sharing something, somehow she's going to make it about her. She's going to be a victim and nothing I do is good enough. (laughs) It sounds like to the team of mom. Yeah. Just like you're describing her pretty good without even knowing her. So in my head, I was thinking, yeah, it's crazy as I grew up and and I kind of distanced myself from my mom. I feel like our relationships changed. And I almost want to say it was stronger when I was fully involved in her day-to-day life. As we're talking about it, I think I'm getting a better picture and a better understanding of boundaries and what that looks like to be able to keep her in my life. I feel like I've taken more control over my life, which in virtue has helped me in her relationship as a grown a grown adult relationship, not, not little Drew and mom relationship. And I think being on this side, it helps me as far as translating what this conversation is into my family. (laughs) I hear my mom say it all the time and now I'm saying it. So this is weird. But my mom always says, I don't want to be my mom. And she is her mom. And so now here I am saying, yo, Doug, I don't want to be my mom. I don't want to fall into what that is. Right. And I feel like I'm falling into what that is. Right. So I would say the biggest difference between you and your mom, psychologically speaking, is that you are talking about these issues and actively trying to wire yourself differently. And you're doing that so you can be who and how you want to be with awareness, with insight. You're looking at, oh, these these kind of I don't know if they're narcissistic traits or borderline trait, whatever it is, but it's this thing. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you will look back on yourself and see how you have been. And if we do that with compassion and understanding and empathy for little Drew, you will really, I think, see your progression. And that's different. It's not your mom. When I first started working with you, little Drew needed constant reassurance. 
mm-hmm. was crying that ex girlfriend was not there for you, how you wanted a girlfriend to be there, which was it wasn't good enough. Mm. You were a victim. It was mostly about her, but it was also <laughs> about you, right? Right. Yeah. But those three things were there. Mm-hmm. And you were afraid of being abandoned. Yeah. Many of us are to a degree. Doesn't mean we're all borderline, but we all can understand. Oh, yeah, that fear of abandonment. I don't want to be abandoned. I don't want to be alone or or left alone. It's when I can't be alone. I can't be abandoned. And if you don't call me for two days, I'm abandoned. And that's true. Uh -uh. I have seen you progress and shift. I don't know if looking back and just the, the frame that I've given that in the context of, oh, I don't want to be my mom. Okay, well, look at how far you've come in just a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, even to to what you just said, as far as like not getting a phone call back for two days, I think three years ago, I would have been down the gutter, you know what I mean? And that's a phone call. And I yeah. think I put myself in the gutter a lot based on my mom not calling me. I think I'm speed coursing this last six months. And I think for good reason, especially in preparation for little Dougie. It's been on my mind a lot, and I think it's future tripping into how am I going to raise him as my son, you know, as I'm prepping for what son is going to be, I think I am ready, you know, emotionally, financially, housing, job, everything on my list that I want to be ready for, maybe in the physical, if that's the right terminology for it, I'm ready for it. And now my mental, as far as what I grew up in, I don't think I've given that a thought until this point. Maybe I have kind of touched on it here and there with mom and dad and this, that, the other brother, all of that. Sure. And now I really want to deep dive into who am I really? What am I able to offer to my son as far as growth and growing up in a safe house. And I don't want the focus to be on, well, I don't want to be these things. I do want to focus on, I do want to be these things because I think that's where I thrive a little bit better as far as, to your point, getting down on myself. And if I focus on what I don't want to be in my mom and I don't want to be in my dad, I'm going to lose myself in all of it. And I won't, I, I won't ever know who I really am. Yep. I think that that's a good realization. I I love that you can see your growth over time and where you want to not wind up, but the kind of father that you want to be speaks volumes to the kind of person you want to be. You are going to be a young dad. You are still figuring out yourself. And guess what? 10 years from now, you will still be figuring out yourself. (laughs) Yeah. I can hear in you a desire to understand and to become and to be without a sense of urgency, which I think is phenomenal. You got baby coming soon, but you know, it's going to be a while before a baby (laughs) really picks up on everything, but you want to exercise the kind of parent you want to be. I can hear you really looking at myself apart from my mom and myself as I was influenced by my mom and dad. That idea of abandonment. Okay. Yeah, we all have a fear of abandonment. The natural way we go is, so I will always be there, so they never feel abandoned. Well, if you're always there, they're going to be codependent. Right. And then when you're not there, they won't know what to do. Mm -hmm. that probably sounds familiar (laughs) yeah yeah it does it's kind of just navigating that feeling that out and what that's like and and recognizing that you're Mm going to make a million and one mistakes with the kid oh yeah oh yeah (laughs) Yeah. it's acknowledging them growing Mm -hmm. with them I think that idea of well I want to make sure I'm doing it right doing it right is Rolling with it, growing, constantly looking at yourself and and testing it and doing it with a partner. 
what I think it comes down to for you is, are you consistent as Drew, Mm -hmm. not as my mom's son and not as my mom, but as me and not as girlfriend's partner, but as me. I think that one's been difficult for me to navigate internally. And I want to be able to love myself in all of it. What do you mean by that? What does that look like? So when you said the word consistent, Mm -hmm. the thought that popped into my head is, yeah, well, I work every day. And then I laughed at myself because it's like, well, okay, I can't. I don't want to say it like that because it's a. I don't. What I was going to say is I don't want to quote unquote just work because that's not quite how I'd want to define myself. And now I'm struggling to find the appropriate time and and being able to compartmentalize my time, not my thoughts, but my time now. I don't know how to say this without being an asshole, so I'm just going to say it. I'm not... Hmm, care is not the right word to use, but I'm going to use it for conversation's sake. Mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily care about being at home 24-7 to raise him yeah. the way I'm gearing up to want to be home 24-7 to raise my son. And I haven't quite felt the guilt of what that is. Because in the back of my head, I'm I'm the second dad. I'm the stepdad. I'm not, quote unquote, the real father. And so right. I kind of right. gave myself a pass to be able to go work seven days a week and, and do all of that. It, it's a conundrum. Like it, It's a conundrum at its finest because I'm in such a good routine right now and I feel very healthy and I'm in a good spot as far as being consistent bringing money home, going to work, getting projects right. done, doing what right. I need to do. Right. Going back to borderline narcissism umbrella conversation of what that is. That's where I really feel like it plays a part in me because I I like working. I like going to jobs and I like accomplishing things for myself. And I've been working the last nine, 10 months on a big project with one of my best friends that I'm really excited about. And I'm not knocking those excitement feelings at all. Like I, I love feeling those. And I, and I don't think that's hand in hand with what I'm talking about, but it's there. The father I want to be is one that is at all the baseball games and the soccer games and goes to the pool and jumps in and has fun and barbecues. And that's my picture perfect world that I foresee. Now what's reality, take a step back from that is I do want to be at baseball games. and I do want to cook for the family and I want to work and I want to accomplish and I want to build something that I can look back on and say that, yeah, I really did that. Me, I did that. That's balancing your priorities and finding compromise at some point. That idea that it's that it's hitting that borderline narcissism place, I think that's your programming from how you were raised and what you see when it's carried out in a certain way that is not healthy. Mm. Just by virtue of you mentioning it is healthy, but I can tell you that your barometer is skewed because of what your experience has been. Yeah, well, in every relationship I've ever had, even somewhat girlfriend, has always told me, one, I work too much, I put work first, and two, three, I don't care about much anything else other than work. And sometimes that might need to be true, and that's okay. It's it's good in the sense that, as I said to you, it's not work-life balance, it's all life. I think that that more hits, I don't want to be my dad. Maybe there's room for this where the version of you that existed a few years ago was sacrificing so much of yourself for others. You're still calibrating and finding where that center point is and and, and where you are with that because I do want to be present more and I want to be working. Okay, You can do both. It's not one Mm. or the other. It might involve some compromise. What you're used to, is it involving sacrifice? And I have to give up one thing entirely to do the other. Yeah. 
I have to give up myself to be there for others. And then mm-hmm. I'll convince myself that being there for others is for me. So we're working on how do I maintain a sense of myself and the things that are important to me while I'm still here for a child. And in the beginning, yes, you will have to give up some of yourself to be with the child. Absolutely. This is stuff that you're looking at, you're calibrating, and I can tell you definitively, you are not your mom. Yeah, You're not your dad either. You are aware of how they have been with you and what that has created in you. So you will, A, not be them, and B, you will be you. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. It's more raspy. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Fuck yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And we are back. We're back. Hell yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. Fuck yeah. (laughs) Okay. I want to start with the fact that Drew and Sarah are reparenting themselves in different ways. And it's really fascinating. It's Gosh. interesting because they're very, very different. It's so different. Childhoods, experiences yes. with their parents. Yes. And stages of life that they're in now. Yes. Drew is younger and just becoming a parent. Sarah mm-hmm. has been a parent. Mm-hmm. And you know what is a parent to me? Oh, my God. Uh, no, go ahead. What go dark? ahead. No, what's apparent to you? That you have something to say. That he is not going to be his parent. Hey, That's apparent there you go. to me, to you. <laughs> I love the way this ended. What I know for sure is that you are going to be you. Yeah. And isn't that just a lovely little message that we could all give ourselves? Because I think we said this in the beginning. Mm. We've all worried at one point or another or have had moments where we're like, oh, my God, that's my mom. Oh, my God, that's my dad. Right. Shout out to my parents. Love them. But there are parts of them I don't want. (laughs) I don't want to be. Totally. And it scares you a little bit. But all in all, you can't become your parents. And if you're in therapy, you're already doing, quote unquote, the work to, like you said, live with integrity and know what your values are and who you want to be and who you don't want to be. Yeah, I think it's course correcting. And if the course Mm -hmm. is you and your integrity and where that is, great. I mean, the line that I said early on in this with Drew, you know, he's a church going guy and was brought up that way Mm -hmm. and said, look, if you just took the Bible for what your pastor told you or for what your parents told you, Mm -hmm. you wouldn't have your own relationship with God and it wouldn't mean Mm -hmm. as much. It's why a lot of kids as they grow up need to take the values that their parents or whoever instilled in them and try them out in the world and see how they go. I like that. Yeah. Like try them on, you know, try them on, wear them out for a little bit, see how they feel. If it doesn't feel right, you can get a new pair of pants. (laughs) (laughs) See, this is me going with the metaphor, (laughs) butchering it. Absolutely butchering it. It was working right up until the point where you laughed. Ah, shoot. I need to be You got to commit. You got to commit to it. I know. Here's my first note. Ready? Bring it. All of this is really Drew just freaking out about being a parent and- What does that even mean? (laughs) There's no question there. That was my observation from the get-go was, wow, Drew, this is all just his, I guess we can call it existential anxiety, but like being a child and then becoming a parent all at the same time is what a mind fuck. Right. And that's something I've reflected to him many, many many times. times. And in this, he's giving me the health update on his heart. We're talking about that. Yes. And then I go like, all right, well, if this was your soon-to-be son. Yeah. And- Kind of like getting him to shift the lens a little bit. To think like a parent? Is that what that was for? Kind of. Or to think as a caretaker for himself as well? Both of those things are true. It's the same thing. Okay. When we're in our own experience and something's happening to us, like I hurt my shoulder, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Right, right. If that was my dog hurt his shoulder, we'd be at the vet the next morning. Right. So why Mm -hmm. do you not care for yourself the same way you would care for others? When we're in our own subjective experience and something's happening, we're Mm -hmm. more likely to be more critical of ourselves. Yeah, critical and we justify things and we make excuses. Right. Yeah. That's why one of the CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, tenants are one of the main things they say to help combat how critical you can be of yourself is- what would you say to a friend yeah. of yours saying this? What would you yeah. say to a six-year-old child who is going through this? Mm-hmm. Right? I think that's a big component of self-compassion too and like compassionate focus therapy. Absolutely. And that works so well because it is so 
simple. I mean, it's difficult to practice, I think, but practice makes practice. Who said that? Sasha said that. And I, I love it. <laughs> Shout out Sasha. But I think that it lands really well for a lot of clients or just a lot of people like, hey, treat yourself like your own best friend, you know, or whoever you care about. What would you say to them? There's a difference in what you just said. You made that I know, very I made that. <laughs> clear. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> I motioned. <laughs> To Kenzie, right? Like a wizard. Well, you said, treat yourself like you would treat your friend. That's an instruction, right? Mm. When you just asked it and said, how would you treat your friend? Okay, okay. That's yes. different. That's getting yes. them to see something. Yes. See, and we've talked about this with Sarah early on, mm -hmm. telling her something would almost just sound like I'm like Berg. I'm like somebody in the car. I'm like oh, right. some, yeah. somebody dictating something mm -hmm. to her, like, do this. Treat yourself well, yeah. this way. Well, yes, we're not going to tell a client like, yeah, do, do this, do right. that. But yes, I like the more open-ended, how right. would you say this or yeah. what would you say? Yeah. yeah. So that's why I ask a lot of questions and, you know, I'll tell a story and then just kind of wait and go, oh, how does that land for you? What do you think of that? And let mm -hmm. them come to the moral of the story or something, or if that resonates or works for them. Right. Remember when you were saying, explain it like I'm six or I'm a sixth grader or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the way you said it made me laugh because you were like, I don't know if you've heard this before, but the whole like explain it like I'm five or explain it like I'm six kind of thing. Right. And clearly you're not a Reddit person, Doug, because there is a whole subreddit that sure. is called explain explain like I'm five. And people just ask things right. and people get explanations yeah. that are very simple. Yep. And it's awesome. Yep. This is not so much a question as maybe just a comment to just inflate your ego for a second here. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> I know. I'm always uh, hesitant to do I'm this. I'm sure but... you'll knock me right back down. <laughs> I'm good at that. Hindsight is 2020. I, I was just really happy that you pointed out not explicitly like his fallacy with the naturopath and like regretting a past decision instead of focusing on the future and what he can do differently. But right. I really appreciated the balanced perspective i mm. think that you take with like western and eastern medicine you know it's a controversial topic so i think that's why i appreciate it because i've certainly got my biases <laughs> with sure you know certain types of medicine or alternative medicines and it would be hard for me to, i think to have a conversation like this with a client or it would have been i think nowadays i'd be fine with it but i know you see an eastern medicine or a naturopath but also, Western medicine is important, too. So Absolutely. I like the balanced perspective there. Not trying to convince him to go one way or the other. Partly, our job as a therapist is not to right. put our values onto yeah, the client. Course, it's to yeah. help recognize theirs. He has a mm -hmm. sometimes healthy, sometimes not healthy yeah. paranoia, fear, distrust mm -hmm. of medical doctors. Which is very valid because of it what is, he has witnessed. Yeah. Right. And even in this session, him going, mm -hmm. yeah, this guy checked me out and said, no, uh, you're fine. You can hear him when I kind of mm -hmm. push on it. He was like, yeah, but a naturopath might have missed this. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. And I think that's why I liked it because I think your balanced perspective allowed him to see it in a more balanced way too and not just be so down on himself for not going the naturopath route. Like you didn't make it about... Eastern versus Western medicine, right? Like it wasn't this philosophical discussion. It was really rooted in his emotional and mental, yeah, the way he sees things and the way right. we'll get to this later, I think. But I think one of Drew's, arguably, I'm not his therapist, but he <laughs> obviously. I am. <laughs> right. So I think one of his biggest cognitive distortions, tendencies, automatic thought processes is to have that binary thinking, that kind of all or nothing thinking. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder if that is a quote unquote trauma response because in psychology I think they call it splitting where you kind of just see things as all good or all bad. I think it's the more like psychodynamic way of using the cognitive distortion of CBT, right? But I wonder if that's also what's going on here for him with like, you know, medicine and his health. Like he just sees doctors as all good, all bad. A lot of that is based on his experience as a child. And what I'm trying to push at yeah. in the session is what's going to be your experience as an adult and as a father. Mm. Right. And where do you mm -hmm. land? It's different than if he had a distrust of medical doctors for some some reason that's his personal faith or something like that. Right. Right. And like a that, conspiracy. As or long, well, I mean, have you heard of this guy, um, Robert Marley? This is not Bob Marley, right? Oh, yes, Bob Marley. Oh my God. <laughs> I was like, you're not really doing this to me, are you? Do, do you know I how, have heard of Bob Marley? Do you know how Bob Marley died? 
was his rejection of Western medicine? Essentially, yeah. Yeah. Bob Marley had cancer, a melanoma. I didn't know There was a melanoma in his toe. Um, Mm -hmm. I think he might have like figured it out after a soccer injury, discovered it, and they went, oh, wow, you have cancer. There's a melanoma. We need to amputate. Uh, And he said, no. I'll just smoke weed. Well, his Rastafarian faith said, Uh, no, we don't do that. Oh, well, yes, of course, if it's actually like rooted in his religious beliefs. Right. And then the cancer spread throughout his body and... He did get, I think, some treatment for cancer at some point, but it had already spread throughout his body and oh. it killed him. Yeah. I wonder, though, if we were to talk to his his ghost, his dead body, <laughs> you know, him dead, if he would regret his decision or if he was happy that he went with his faith. I don't think he would regret his decision because it was a decision based on his faith and his faith yeah. was strong till the end. But then what do you do about someone like Steve Jobs? Right. It's not faith based, but he tried to cure his cancer with like carrot juice. And that didn't work. Okay. So anyway. <laughs> but that was his choice. Anyway, we're getting way off we track. We are way off track. Let's bring it back. Okay. Well, my next question was going to be the thing that I asked earlier, but how would this conversation look like with Drew if he was <laughs> like his mom or if he was fitting the criteria for NPD, you know, narcissistic personality disorder. Because you get into a discussion here really about the difference between narcissism and borderline, right. which I find interesting because he is concerned about being narcissistic when really he actually has more borderline traits. That's why I brought that up. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I wanted a little bit more of his emotional response to having borderline traits as opposed to narcissism. Mm. And maybe that's also, I couldn't help but think of the gender stereotype with the two, because I think... Typically, you think of women with borderline personality disorder and men with narcissism. I don't. You don't. One might. Good for you, Doug. I (laughs) I think a lot of people do, though. I I think a lot of people that don't do the kind of work that we do or work in certain circles might think that. And remember the caveat that I gave when I was giving him these two different psychological terms and breaking them down. Yeah. I said, we're not talking about diagnosing from the DSM. Right. We're just saying here are some things, you know, here are some characteristics, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So part of me doing that was to distinguish between the two and part was to just, in a sense, normalize, not abnormalize, but normalize characteristics. Mm -hmm. I -hmm. mean, if we think about the root of borderline, that it comes from a fear of abandonment, right? right? I mean, I am very much simplifying something. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. But that's, yeah. But if we go with that, nobody likes the feeling of abandonment. Yeah, right, right. right? Most people would say they have a fear of abandonment. Sure. And most people will try to do something to not be abandoned, mm-hmm. right? Some people pleasing. Yeah, or right? attention seeking or sure, whatever. Sure, sure. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do some things. And mm-hmm. those are just characteristics and traits that I've learned that yeah. help me not fear abandonment or help me not be abandoned. Like, okay, right. cool. Mm-hmm. When it's a functional impairment, when it impacts your daily life, when it affects your interpersonal relationships, Mm -hmm. that's when we go, oh, wait, is this Mm -hmm. your personality and is this how you've developed? And Mm -hmm. there might be something here, right? A full-blown personality disorder. Right, right. Right. And disorder means something is out of order. Out of order. Right? Yeah. Discord, dissonance, like, okay, Mm -hmm. that's not going Mm -hmm. back to my integrity. That's not how I really want to be, but why am I acting this way? Why? Yeah. Am I my mother? You're not your mother, but you are acting similarly because you saw that that's how she did it and that's how you learned. And okay, now can we do something different? So I'm walking through some of that with him without saying, yeah, you're not your mom, but you're kind of like borderline-y and you have some of those characteristics like she did or she does. I I don't know that that's necessarily accurate, but it's more nuanced than that. Yeah, it is. And I think you do a good job of explaining that. Like- well, thank you. There Kinsley. are, you're welcome, Doug. <laughs> there are certainly traits, but I think it's also the validation of the function of what these traits has been for him, right? And I right. think when it comes to Drew, it's his relationship to his girlfriend and obviously his parents too, and his exes too. I know you've brought up his exes before, right? And that fear, right. that threat. And that was kind of the splitting I was talking about earlier, like the all or nothing thinking of like, okay, well, if someone doesn't text me back for a few days- Right. Then they're dead to me. I mean, that's why I use that example because that did happen to him Mm -hmm. and he did freak out. And then he found out that his friend just like 
his phone yeah, died or he lost his phone course. or something. And it was like, yeah. oh, okay. Mm-hmm. But these are things that I'm highlighting for him. Even if I just throw in something like, well, yeah, if somebody doesn't call you back for two days, that's because we talked about it several sessions ago and it was something that impacted him and that highlights this. He said it, I questioned myself like, wait, did this really happen? Or am I just using this as a way to get extra attention or something? Or wait, am yeah. I creating this? And what? oh my gosh, what's going on? His head is now messing with him because it's saying- yeah. They didn't call you for two days. They don't like you. You did something wrong. You better make it up to them. And Mm -hmm. that's the fear of abandonment coming in. Of course. Yeah. What about his, not paranoia, but when, you know, in this session when he's like, oh my God, am I being my mom by using my medical issues to get attention? Mm -hmm. How do you kind of reconcile that? Because there's no objective truth or answer to get to, but how do you gauge like, yeah, maybe you are doing that or- is that a bad thing? Or is, you know, can we change that? Like, do you know what I mean? Because you can't pull his girlfriend into the session, right? And be like, how are you observing him? Is he actually doing these things? Like, is it bothering you? Or do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, totally. I mean, that's exactly the point where I introduced the borderline, not just the narcissism, Mm. to kind of understand what's going on here. He's seeing it as narcissistic, making it all Uh, about him. Okay, yes. Right, the way that his mom made it all about her. And that's Mm -hmm. where, you know, I I throw in the three things of, you know, it's always about them, they're Mm -hmm. always a victim, and it's never good enough. Yeah, he's like, oh, that's my mom. (laughs) Right, and that idea is not a narcissistic necessarily thing. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that's a narcissist. It's that I'm doing this because I am afraid of being abandoned, and here's how I know that that makes that okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at for him, like, all right, well, well what's behind you doing it? Mm. Instead of making it about, I don't yeah. want to be my mom. My mom does this. Like, okay, right. well, why are you what doing it? What are the it? functions what's going for on? you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What does it do for him? Right. What right. does it do for him, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's for him to discover. Oh. You know, and that's something I said to him, like, look, all these characteristics. We all have these characteristics to some degree. Absolutely. It's how pervasive does it become? I think for him, why I highlighted some of his past relationships and and Mm -hmm. it's interesting that he's framing it, we're both framing it in this session in the context of becoming a a parent, Mm -hmm. which is what you and I were just talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. And that idea of what he's worried about is that I will focus so much on myself and I don't want to be a narcissist that way, Mm, right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't want to be like my mom who's so focused on herself. I want to make sure I focus on my kid too. And what I loved is that, you know, we're trying to figure out a way for you to be yourself and what Mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I don't remember when he said it, it was something about being consistent yeah, consistency. Well, you yeah. you commented on it. You were like, ooh, yeah, that word consistency, right? Right, right? Yeah, there was something in there. I think it was all connected to to not wanting to be mom, but also not wanting to be dad. Am I good? Right. No, you're good? you're absolutely right. Not wanting to be mom because mom made it all about her. Not wanting to be dad because dad was so like, Absol- I'm out of here. I'm <laughs> yeah. just going to go work. Work is my thing. And yeah. he's like, uh-oh, I love work. I don't want to be my dad and right. do that. right. He doesn't want to be his dad because he doesn't want to be working all the time, although he does truly care about work. He loves it. He loves working, but he also wants to be present. And I think there's a little, speaking of guilt, he feels a little guilty. Actually, no, maybe he specified, I can't remember now, that he didn't feel that guilty about wanting to be more of a dad or be more present for his actual, you know, birth child that's coming right right as opposed right. to like the kid who's already there which he is right. dad for that kid but that right. kid also has another dad so this is his first time being real bio dad and really wants to be fully present but right. like those are right. the plates that were spinning you know right. and the balance work life that you were talking about last time too and why i spun the word consistent yeah is the idea i think is being consistently drew Mm. and being that, Mm -hmm. right? He even said what you're talking about, Kenzie, that idea of, well, wait, this kid that's actually gonna be my biological kid, I can feel that I'm gonna want to be there 24 seven for him all the time and be there all the time and and, and be consistent. Like, well, maybe consistency is being yourself Mm, and not running away or not doing this or not doing that. But I think he is struggling with that. What his struggle seems to be in this session is if I want to, go to work and be at work because I love doing that. That Mm -hmm. makes me feel like me, 
right? Mm -hmm. But how can I do that and not become my dad who is at work all the time? Right. And how can I not be my mom Mm -hmm. who made everything about her? Yeah. And what is the answer? Because to me, I just keep thinking, well, I guess we just, you said it, like calibrate, right? Or course correct. You kind of just keep a finger on the pulse and like, okay, we check in every now and then. We see, we take inventory, we reevaluate. Right. See how we're doing. Right. And I think of the concept of the good enough parent. You know, it used to be good enough mother, but it's good enough parent now. Right. I think yep. of just I think that's where the consistency comes in too, of like you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be consistent. You just have to be there. Explain what you mean by good enough parent for people that are not in oh, psychology yes. and don't know that term. There's a psychology term, I believe it's Winnicott who came up with it, the theory of like the good enough mother at first, but now has evolved to good enough parent where if you do good enough as a parent if you're there you take care of your kid you feed them you care for them you're not you meet their you meet their developmental needs needs. yeah Yeah. you meet their needs but you're not perfect you make mistakes you rupture repair right right that's the good enough parent and it's just that it's good enough right (laughs) and i think it helps take some of the pressure and stress off of some parents that's why i even said to him look you're gonna be a dad who's gonna make a million mistakes with your kid oh yeah because you're human. Right. And yeah. that's okay. And it was Winnicott. And that was Winnicott's point. Like, <gasps> hell yeah. <laughs> it, it's not about not making mistakes. It's yeah. about being attentive, yeah. responsive, yes. and adaptive when you do make mistakes yeah, and, flexible. and being yeah. there and mm-hmm. giving your child the sense mm-hmm. that there is somebody there. Yes. Right. That's the consistency. Yeah. Right. It's, like it's in not therapy. the perfection. <laughs> right. In therapy, you want to be good enough, right? You want to be present, consistent, and you're going to make mistakes. So rupture repair, baby. He was really worried about losing his current routine, his work life mm-hmm. balance, you know, and, and yes. I mean that in the sense of rest and play. Right. But also, he's at work a lot. And then he's at home a lot. So it's Mm -hmm. more like work home balance is what Mm -hmm. he was talking about. Yeah. Well, you have to learn to calibrate that. And Mm -hmm. yes, it's about balancing priorities and everybody struggles with balancing priorities. And that's why you're not parenting alone in a vacuum. You have a co-parent. Yes. It takes a village, as they say. Yeah. It does in the sense that if you're so focused on you and balancing your own priorities what about your partner what about their Mm -hmm. priorities Mm -hmm. you know there's a line Mm -hmm. i throw on my clients every now and then that are in relationships Mm -hmm. and it's about how do you protect each other's solitude Mm. like i like that look for that in each other where do you go oh wow you need to Mm -hmm. go work out of the gym and spend some time with the guys you need to go have a spa day and Mm -hmm. and just chill out or you need to go Mm -hmm. lift weights whatever Mm -hmm. it is yeah spending your own time and recognizing that not just you but your partner needs some of that i like that yeah i had a thought well okay this maybe is opening a can of worms but just really quickly i think i'll just summarize what my thoughts are maybe on it instead of opening the can (laughs) of worms but the thought the notion the concept of balance right like i think people think that balance is this like okay i've reached balance (laughs) like i have balance in my life i'm in the middle of the seesaw the weights are distributed evenly I'm balanced. But really, I think balance is, didn't we talk about this last time? Like running back and forth on the seesaw a little bit or like calibrating as you go. There's no actual destination of balance. It's like, okay, sometimes I feel like I have too much work. Okay, let's activate the rest or play. There's no just like, okay, I've made it. That's why I love that Rick and Morty episode where Rick finds absolute level for morty oh yes oh right? my god and he just can't handle it he just because it's uh, too it's yeah too much it's too yeah. overwhelming <laughs> right and he can't handle absolute level right right yeah that's like absolute balance mm-hmm. i don't know that that exists i think I it's, think it's it the, like you said that seesaw there's yeah. not just one single center point right and if you did find it cool you can't move yeah you then can't what breathe. <laughs> yeah you're you, stuck you shift anything uh-huh yeah. one microbe and and it yeah. throws it all off. So mm-hmm. the idea of the seesaw and the idea of how I talk about the pendulum swinging a lot mm-hmm. is there yeah. might be a center area, not necessarily a center point, mm-hmm. and we kind of move around and oscillate yeah. in that zone. Yeah. And we course correct and sometimes we'll go mm-hmm. a little too far this way or a little too far that way. Okay. Yeah. It's a relief and it's like, oh gosh, wow, that's adulting. We don't just reach it. We don't reach a moment of like, right. oh, I've made it. It's nope. It's a continuous effort and what you're saying, kind of pinballing yeah. and just figuring much, it out as you go. It's a process. Much like this 
podcast. Like this podcast. <laughs> very see? nice. Very see? nice. You see right through we my segues. We got there. I really do now. <laughs> I, I see you. I see it in your brain when Aww, it comes out. That makes me feel so seen. Oh, good. I'm glad I could make you feel so seen, Doug. Yes. And we're glad that you guys are out there to make us feel heard. Oh, that was good. Right? Yeah, that was really good. Nice. I have nothing that's better than that. So we should just wrap up now. All right. Just like that. <laughs> just Cut. Abruptly. We're out. Done. <laughs> we'll talk <laughs> to you not? next week. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.